Hey everyone, how's everyone doing? So my name is Faye Rosenfeld. I am the Vice President of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library. And I am so, so excited to welcome all of you to live from NYPL. To everyone in the room, to everybody who's watching us online, thank you so much for being with us. Tonight's guest is very special. Drag queen, visual artist, speaker, illustrator, and newly minted author, Sasha Velour. <laughs> and joining Sasha in conversation is the eminent drag historian, a professor at NYU and at the New School, Joe E. Jeffries. It is just a dream combination. And tonight, they are here to talk about Sasha's incredible new book, The Big Reveal, an illustrated manifesto of drag. It's a completely original work, a little bit of memoir, a little bit of history, and a whole lot of Sasha. And I know you're going to want to pick up a copy, and we can help you with that. The library shop is here selling copies right over there, and Sasha will be signing them afterwards. If you're watching on the live stream, um, there should be a link in the chat uh, for you to purchase the book online. All purchases made here benefit the New York Public Library. Of course, you can also check out a copy of the book with your library card, which I know you all have. Um, you can go to any branch or to your Simply, to the Simply E app and check it out online. However you get it, um, I really encourage you to get your hands on it. It is fabulous. Sasha's book comes at a critical moment. Earlier this year, Tennessee became the first state to pass a law explicitly banning drag shows in public spaces. <laughs> and similar proposals have been introduced in at least 14 other state legislatures around the country. And those are just some of the 452 anti-LGBTQ laws that the ACLU is tracking around the country. And while no such legislation is on the docket in New York, it's not like we aren't also witnessing discrimination and bigotry here. For years, the library has partnered with Drag Story Hour, and we've seen multiple attempts by protesters to shut their readings down. But the library remains committed to supporting Drag Story Hour, which is so popular with our patrons, and to offering a wide array of programs that reflect the beautiful diversity of the communities that we serve. And, And likewise, right here at our research library, we remain committed to collecting and preserving the incredible history of drag as we have been doing for over 50 years. The New York Public Library is proud to house one of the premier collections of LGBTQ history in the world, including the archives of such pivotal drag performers and activists as Charles Pierce, Charles Bush, Joan Jett Black, Stormy De La Viere, and Lee Brewster, as well as archives documenting the ballroom scene and much more. And all of our collections, like all of our collections, all of this material is available to everyone for free. All you need is that library card. OK. In a minute, I'm going to bring our speakers on stage. Sasha would love to answer some of your questions at the end of the conversation. For those of you in the room, you have note cards on your chairs with pencils. Um, some of our staff members, our wonderful staff, will be coming around to collect those note cards. So please write your question at any time, uh, and one of, someone will pick it up. And if you're watching online, you can send your questions right into the chat, or you can also send us an email, publicprograms at nypl.org. Um, wherever you are, we would really love to hear from you. Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and of course, by all of you, our wonderful supporters and friends, near and far. Thank you so much for that support, and with that, please join me in welcoming Joe E. Jeffries and Sasha Velour. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, wow. Uh, thank you all so Whoa. much for coming. Thank you so much. It's so amazing to see so many beautiful faces. Huge thank you to the New York Public Library for making this happen. Yes. Thank you to Grace and Margie 
and everybody, Faye, for making this happen for us here at the New York Public Library. We're both so honored to be here in discussion today with Sasha Valor about the new book, The Big Reveal, an illustrated manifesto of drag. <laughs> so, welcome to our adult drag story hour. As you can see, live from Nipple. <laughs> Gonna start here uh, just telling you a little bit about the book and then turning it over to Sasha for a second. Uh, the book is remarkable. The book not only tells Sasha's personal story, it also dives deep into the history of drag, which I am thrilled about as a drag historian, back to the Mesolithic era, as a matter of fact. Uh, and then on top of that, it is a manifesto. It talks about revolution. It gives you critical analysis of camp. It is quite weighty, but also at the same time, quite fun. It is in various styles. It kind of starts and ends as a graphic novel goes into remarkable layouts with uh, illustrations, so uh, I can't say enough uh, praise about this book. But Sasha, I want to turn it over to you. Tell us, where does your style come from? <laughs> Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm really happy to hear that you approve of the history. I was uh, nervous to hear what the experts think, um, but that means everything. Um, and I'm indebted to your work collecting so much history. It's been pieced together through collectors and nerds, much like myself, um, to hold on to this history. And I, I wanted to capture it here and mix it with we drag Fun. nerds. Love it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, and there's some things from the New York Public Library archives in here as well. A photo of Zazu Nova, one of the leaders, uh, one of the underappreciated leaders of the Stonewall Uprising. Um, but yes, back to style. Well, this piece actually was made by Pieretta Victory, who's in the audience tonight. <laughs> and... The, the fabric uh, was made by me and my partner, Johnny, who's here in the front row. Uh, it's, it is the end pages of the book. We wanted to make traditional end papers. It's very literate, right? The end papers <laughs> for the library. Um, well, I'm sorry to say we only succeeded in making one. Only one of the pieces of paper turned out beautiful. And so we ran with it. Um, it's very hard to do water marbling, but uh, turned it into fabric. And I wanted to wear an outfit that was like the book, Come to Life. So I thought, black jacket, technicolor interior. I'm, when it comes to fashion, thankfully, I think I have never cared about looking good, which I feel like is something people care, or being comfortable as well. Looking good and being comfortable don't matter at all to me. <laughs> so that allows it to be about fun. I'd rather be memorable looking to myself. I want to remember what I wore at some random day, um, or, and to other people as well, hopefully. Something memorable. Um, good is to changing. It, the idea of what looks good changes so much over time, so might as well have fun. One of the manifesto kind of parts of the book, you talk about the difference between, say, costume and fashion, and then its relationship to gender. Could you uh, expound and manifestoize yes. for us on that? Um, I kind of go off on fashion, which I, at times I felt bad about, because I do still want invites to fashion shows and to borrow <laughs> pieces from fashion brands. Um, but at the time, I had never been invited to a fashion show so I, when I was writing it. So I was like, yeah, I will. Let's throw fashion under the bus. But really, fashion is an industry. It has restrictions. It operates from principles of exclusion um, and, you know, scarcity. But clothes can be so much more. And I think queer people, drag artists, know the way that clothes can have power to transport you into a fantasy, to create another world, to bring your dreams to life on your body. And so I love costumes. and. The idea that costumes are not something that one would wear in real life. They're for a theatrical version of life. That sounds better to me, because I, 
I would like for my drag to be about a utopia of what could be, not what is. So I, I go for the most impractical clothes possible. <laughs> and you say in the book that uh, it may be costume for the character, but for the character themselves, it is fashion. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. And yours, I mean, we can kind of blame this to some extent, your sense of style on your grandmother's and your mother. Tell us about your <laughs> grandmother's uh, impact on your early young Sasha. <clears throat> well, I believe I, I told RuPaul that I got no sense of fashion from my mother, I have to say. She was so smart, but she did not like shopping. She did not like clothes. The only pairs of high heels in the house were a pair of tap shoes from her childhood. So when I tried them on, like every child, I had to walk very quietly when I was testing out <laughs> a high heel. But my grandma Dina, my dad, and my dad is actually here tonight, oh. somewhere out in the audience. Hi, Papa Valour. <laughs> yes, Papa Valour. Wow. And his mother, grandma, my grandma Dina, um, I talk about her a great deal in the book, and she was an immigrant. Um, she had seen a lot of war in her life, and she said that that made having bad experiences made her more dramatic and more inclined for the finer things in life. And she never had a lot of money, but she lived very decadently. And her closet was the one full of sequin jackets and long, like, moo-moos with floral prints. And she let me try them on. And that was that first experience of putting on something heavy and hard to wear and joyful. And I've kind of never looked back ever since then. As the winner of uh, season nine of RuPaul's Drag Race, you're known for... Right? Yeah. You are known for a historic landmark reveal. <laughs> and the book is titled The Big Reveal. Now, I want to show you uh, more about the book. If we could put up slide number one, which uh, I believe might be up. There's number one. So that is the dust jacket, right? Now, uh, let's go to slide number two, because this is what happens if you remove the dust jacket. <laughs> there is a reveal, right? I also then want to show you the back of the book, because there is yet another reveal. Like I said, this is our adult drag story hour. Slide number three, please. Very grateful to my editor, Jenny, who <laughs> argued for that butt picture on the back of this book. I don't know whether it was a financial or moral concern that made them almost not want to print it, but Harper agreed to put my ass on the cover of this book. <laughs> if you can't sign it with your, own with your own butt, then have you really written a book? <laughs> so I want to talk about some of the places that your career kind of uh, starts. Because your career starts, well, we were just talking about some uh, drag pageants that you did early on in the city. <laughs> we, where we first met. Yeah, where we first met at some of these uh, various drag pageants. You also produced uh, a zine yeah. called Velour. Well, the first issue is Y V Y M. And if we could now put up slides, uh, let's see, I have to check my list here, uh, seven, eight, and nine. I'm going to show you those here. This is the first issue, VYM. The second one, which then becomes named Velour. Yes, we got our branding together for, by then. <laughs> and then the third one, and these kind of uh, span the period before, during, and after your drag race time. So they are kind yeah. of interesting time capsules. And inside, it's uh, again a mix of graphic novel cartoons, whoops, editorial photography, wonderful uh, stories and interviews. No, these are quite, uh, quite great. So uh, thank you for putting these out into the world as well. And this book reflects some of the same kind of aesthetics, right, in the uh, design. Yeah, I, I'm, I learned, I was <laughs> saying backstage, I, I went to school for an MFA program for cartooning. I wanted to learn all the all the ins and outs of being a 
graphic novelist and cartoonist, and they kind of prepared me and all the students there to never get a book publishing deal and just to sell and make your own books and still make a living doing that. And that is kind of how I hit the ground running when I first moved to New York City. My partner, Johnny, actually had the idea to make a magazine mm -hmm. um, as a, a project that we would do together. And it was kind of a way to make connections with people, um, visual artists that I knew from going to zines and selling my, my comic books, which were all about drag. I wrote a comic about the Stonewall Uprising that kind of dramatized it for the page. Um, and then all the drag artists that I was meeting through various pageants and combined them and made matches between visual artists and drag performers that made sense. Um, and then, yeah, self-published, fundraised to get the money to print just a couple hundred issues <laughs> and um, made cold calls. It's very satisfying. Uh, seeing my this book for sale in bookstores that turned us down for the magazine. <laughs> so, but yes, and then certain design things that, that I was playing with, because I did all of the layout for those initial magazines using torn paper, um, using lots of handwriting, and I guess that kind of became a signature of mine. I started using it in my merchandise, um, and at this point, I guess I'm stuck with it. <laughs> so I put, made sure to put it in this book, too. So let's talk about this uh, velour name, since it's come up on the zine. Now, I just read uh, Craig Selliman's new biography of the San Francisco on Australian drag performer Doris Fish. Yes. Doris Fish passes away in 1991, but you have a connection to Doris Fish that the story began for me there because I never really thought about where the last name Valour came from. You've always been called Sasha. Yeah. But then the story continues in here. So tell us the story of how you're connected to Doris Fish. Gladly. So yes, my, my dad was the one who gave me the name Sasha, um, named after Russian revolutionaries. <laughs> um, oh, male and female Sasha's, so it's kind of a non-binary name to begin with. Um, and since I, then I met so many drag artists who had this name too, it kind of made sense I would just keep it. But then Velour, I was watching my favorite, literally my favorite movie of all time is Vegas in Space, which was produced on a shoestring budget made of cardboard and tinsel by Doris Fish in the late 80s. Um, it, came, it didn't come out until after her death, I believe. Um, but I, I watched it and I fell in love with it. And there's a, a character in it named Babs Valour, who is a shoplifter. And when the queen of police catches her red-handed, they call, uh, the punishment for shoplifting is that they call her mother. And the mother is like the worst punish, stricter than the law itself. And so I was joking. Well, I was kind of obsessed with the idea of shoplifting a little. And my first comics <laughs> were all about me stealing tights and various drag accoutrements from Walmart, um, some of which was a true story. Um, so it made sense as a shoplifting name and as a name of someone who's come from a long line of women who were you know, more knowledgeable and maybe stricter than law enforcement. <laughs> Mopping, yes. Sense. Yeah. So uh, also, uh, tell us about nightgowns. Nightgowns is an important part of your uh, drag journey. It begins at a little bar in uh, Bushwick mm -hmm. called Bazaar and has since moved to National Sawdust. And was it a $3 bill for a... Never at $3. Never at $3. Okay, <laughs> National Sawdust, and is currently now at uh, La Poisson Rouge on yes. Bleecker Street, where it sold out from January until the show Who's in June. Who's seen Nightgowns? Anyone yeah. in this audience? Yeah, so, well, you can check it out on YouTube. We are posting all Just of the Just had a Nightgowns last night, as a matter of fact. You're coming Just fresh out of a Nightgowns. Just had Nightgowns last night. Um, yeah, Nightgowns was the place I got to become Sasha Valor and develop my drag performances, start playing with projections. And when I was writing the book, I, I want it to sound like the kinds of things that I say on the microphone at a drag show. The mix of philosophy and political calls to action and then just stupid stories to <laughs> pass the time and keep people entertained or vamp while something is being adjusted behind the curtains. Um, so yeah, 
I think uh, the live drag show is one of the highest forms of art in the world. So I'm really grateful to Nightgowns and to the people who've kept supporting it. Yeah, if you've never checked out a Nightgowns, please get to a Nightgowns. It is a variety bill of drag, including Sasha, unlike many that you will ever see. Um, so speaking of, you mentioned your, your use of video in drag. Um, Sasha has toured the world uh, with a show called Smoke and Mirrors. Uh, if you could uh, put up slide number, let me get my slide number here. Slide number did, 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 uh, 13. This is uh, Smoke and Mirrors. You have played this in over 21 countries at this point in time to audiences well over 100,000. But what is unique uh, about the show and about Sasha's Drag is the use of video. So uh, if you could put up slide number uh, 14, please. This shows uh, from the cellophane number. As you can see there, Sasha's standing in a white gown and the video white light is just kind of scrubbing through and lighting Sasha and then it just begins to completely fill the stage and color Sasha and images of yourself are being projected onto yourself. Uh, episode, uh, slide number 15, the Decepticon. You'll see Sasha is dancing with themselves, right? Uh, as backup dancers. So tell us about this use of video. I mean, I, you are a graphic designer, you're a cartoonist. I kind of see this as that merger of the performance and the technology. Uh, well, this, the Decepticon with the backup dancers is very, you know, like Beyonce Super Bowl, but the bootleg version. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, I, I loved playing with that uh, because I was used to using computers to make my art, um, being able to make something for the stage. I kind of say like, I think being a terrible dancer is a huge advantage to me in my career because it's pushed me to come up with other ways to make a really strong performance. And I love using visuals, drawing on my special skills to make something exciting. That cellophane performance I first made for Bizarre Bushwick for the little bar. And I was experimenting with how to use the projector to, um, to light my face and create a, a spotlight in a venue that did not have good lighting. And I actually read recently in a piece about Darcel, who re just recently passed away, one of the leaders of Portland drag for many decades, that in the old days they would sometimes use a slide projector with a white circle to do the exact same thing. So this is a, a tradition of finding gorgeous lighting in bizarre places. <laughs> and then I was playing with other, other ways to use this projector once it was pointed at the stage. <laughs> and that was um, screen recorded of me like drawing with various preset brushes in Photoshop. <laughs> it's sort of a little MS Paint looking. But I tried to recreate that number using proper animation techniques and it was nowhere near as good. So sometimes the bootleg version is more artistic. At least that's what I tell myself. No, I remember seeing a number at uh, one of the nightgowns at Bazaar where you were kind of just wearing a large white caftan and it was a tightrope walker that just kind of walked across the, uh, yes. the dress. There was just a line that came across the dress and then the tightrope walker. It was beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous because it is a unique use of uh, really interactive, highly engaging video. It's not just a background. It is total environment and on your body and outside of your body. It's, uh, it's a fascinating uh, technique that you have. Um, you talk about the importance of drag history in the book. And, and you go through a lot of drag history, introducing a lot of uh, people. As a drag historian, can you just expound for a moment for us about the importance of drag history, why you feel it is important? Oh, I want to hear your answer to this, too, as a drag okay. historian. Um, I feel you, you have that title almost more than I. But to me, that the context of drag, the ways in which it has been boundary-breaking and radical and political, especially the ways, I mean, creatively, in all the arts, I think everything has kind of been done before. So to know that history, to know what's been done, and then to still try to find maybe new ways to combine it or recontextualize it, you, you have to know where you came from to do anything new um, or to discover the impossibility of it. And then when it comes to the political history, I felt like that was so important. So often people perhaps know about Cre about the art of drag, 
but to know that it's been tied so strongly to people advocating for queer and trans people off stages, that the stage is actually just a platform for raising awareness of the, the fight for queer and trans liberation, or if it was in a time where maybe that wasn't welcome on the stage or a context where things had to be more entertaining, drag was a space for queer and trans people to find employment and community, and the politics were maybe happening in the dressing room or in the magazines that they published about themselves. So I wanted to give that context to remind all the performers like me today that we come from a tradition of standing up and standing very loudly on behalf of the entire community um, and fighting any kind of oppression, any kind of legal socioeconomic discrimination um, to make a better world. It's not just to make entertainment. It's making entertainment with a very strong mission behind it. And to really have one of the best kind of uh, thorough synopses and questionings and reevaluations of Stonewall I've ever read. Thank Those you. three or four pages are really quite remarkable. It's not just taking the story as it is traditionally handed down. It's really looking at it and saying, oh, let's reconsider some of what we've been told and you know, get this, because history is important to get yeah. correct or as correct as can be, right? right? Um, it's now time for my reveal, talking about uh, drag history here. Uh, in my pocket, this is not just any ordinary pocket square. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. This is one of a design that Sasha made called the Faces of Drag, based off a mask that Sasha made of these dra various drag performers, so here we go. La la. There we go. Thank you. And like to tell us about these for those, well, for those who don't know, the this is like a traditional flagging code in lavender, which means that you're into drag queens. Um, so I don't know. I can't remember whether left pocket or right pocket is. Submissive or dominant when it comes to drag queens, but you know, wear it around and find out. <laughs> and then I wanted to put faces of some, some just a, a sampling of some of the history. And all these figures are in the book, but this corresponded with some actual masks that I made out of paper mache and painted and then hung in the lobby of a nightgown's performance. Kind of like sacred. Um, sacred icons, I guess, of these leaders, these literal icons who have come before in our community. So there's some famous names like Divine, um, Josephine Baker, Barbette, um, who toured the world, and then some figures that I think are really important that maybe many people, even other drag performers, don't know about, like Jose Saria, who founded the Imperial Court System and was the first drag artist to run for, for office. Um, Cochinelle, who was a trans feminine drag queen in Paris in the 50s, who founded a huge organization to help finance and fundraise other trans women's surgeries, mostly in Morocco in the mid-century. Mid um, yeah, and what do we have? Uh, Re the Rebecca riots, which were Welsh peasants who dressed up in drag to resist the expanding British Empire and resist taxation. and. I think drag was both a combination of like a disguise so that they could commit radical illegal acts, but also it tapped into ancient traditions of, um, of masquerade as a space where you're free from all kinds of norms. And you kind of think, as someone who m maybe steps outside of a gender binary, you also are free to think outside of other constrictions in society that don't make sense. So, the history of drag. Available on sashavalour.com. <laughs> so, we've just crowned, today is Monday, 
on Friday, we crowned a new winner of RuPaul's Drag Race season 15. <laughs> this winner is also named Sasha. It's kind of coincidentally amazing to me that you, Sasha, were crowned the winner when RuPaul's Drag Race moved to VH1. This Sasha is now crowned the winner as it has moved to MTV. In the book, Sasha Colby is mentioned several times. You've worked with Sasha Colby in the Nightgown series. Uh, Sasha Colby makes quite an amazing cameo in the book with a psychic phone call connection. But in the book, you also talk about uh, the advice that Bob the Drag Queen, winner of season eight, right before you, and Bianca Del Rio, winner of season six, gave you once you had won. Basically, it was pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I will have you know I did say that to Sasha Colby when I saw her immediately after winning. That's what I, I said. Actually, what advice would you give to Sasha Judy Colby? to remind you to pay your taxes this year? <laughs> <clears throat> You'll see in the book, I actually did not pay my taxes that year, and it created many years of suffering after that I'm still paying off. But. So really, everyone should pay your taxes, but especially if you win a ridiculous uh, prize that <laughs> is already taxed. You're already being taxed. And this year, it's $200,000. I know. Yes. Uh, well, that's like, you know, 140. But what other advice would you give Sasha Colby? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, when... When we did the Nightgowns musical in 2020, uh, we had a scene in that where it, I, I hosted, I played a character who hosted a pageant, and she was a documentarian, actually, who ends up competing after all the contestants uh, run away, or there's various scandals in our musical. You can watch that on YouTube, too. And she ends up winning the pageant. And I, I was like, oh, well, wouldn't it be cute? I'll just bring, we were looking for a crown and I wanted to use my drag race crown. And she said no, because it would be bad luck because she wanted the drag race crown. And I, I, I did not know at that time that she was interested in drag race. So that created a huge conversation. And I refused, I kind of refused to give her advice because she did not need advice from me. <laughs> she just needed to trust her instincts and do the amazing Sasha Colby artistry that she's known for. And um, she, she made all of us so proud. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for her reign, <laughs> whatever that may be. No, it should be amazing. So drag is under attack all across America. There is legislation in at least 16 state legislatures at this point trying to go through that would restrict drag in some way, shape, or form. Some of the legislation is against drag performances in public spaces. Some of it has to do with minors being in the audience. In Texas, there would actually be a bounty on the head of the drag performer or the producer that somebody could report in. In other states, it's about reclassifying the business as an adult establishment, which would then change their taxes and the way they could let people in. Um, and some of this is clearly also aimed at the trans communities, these legislations, in the slipperiness of the way that things are talked about and defined. Uh, Tennessee talks about uh, the drag being prurient, right? If it appeals to a prurient interest, which, well, prurience is in the eyes of the beholder, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, you did an interview with Good Morning America in which you talked about this, and please talk about this some, but you spoke about the anti-drag individuals as perhaps the true groomers. Oh, definitely. Right? Yes, I mean, by the logic of that word, it's about training vulnerable young people in particular to go against their instincts and do something that is bad for them like to be ashamed of something so deeply natural, so truly a part of world culture, and that children understand 
gender play, understand fluidity between gender roles so naturally. I was a queer child myself. I remember this. I remember learning to feel shame from other students and at school because of the way I wanted to dress and my vision of myself as someone who wasn't exactly a man. Um, and so to try to beat that out of children and make young people feel scared of who they are, that's horrible. That is, that is a crime. That is dangerous for young people. And I guess what we know or assume or can deduce is that the most vocal anti-drag, anti-trans voices are obviously, they're, they're a little too interested in us. They are obsessed for whatever reason. Like to not be able to look away or just mind their own business suggests they're either attracted in ways they cannot handle, they wonder what having those pathways would have meant for themselves and they don't want to face that. So I just hope for them to have some peace, some freedom in their lives, a little more appreciation of glamour, and I think they, I believe that they can heal themselves. Poor dears. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I personally was groomed to be heterosexual. It really didn't work out. <laughs> In the book, you uh, mention an idea with this book of kind of on a daily basis, if people feel the need, they might take this book and just flip a page and find a sentence that they could use then as a mantra for the day. So. I'm going to ask if you would do that. Just take your book, flip it to a random page, see if you can find something this. that we can all then maybe use as our mantra for tomorrow. I'm very superstitious, so I thought this would be good. I tried to, you know, put something really meaningful on every page with the hopes that if you just opened it randomly, you would strike something. Okay. Oh, that's a photo. Okay. <laughs> but it's a really good photo. <laughs> Taken by Maddie Ostrowski, who's in the audience as well. Okay. I need the microphone. Okay. This says, anyone can do a reveal, although it may seem like you need official dispensation to stage a drama, all it really takes is theatricality and a plan. It works. Very true, thank you, yes. If I can do a reveal, anybody can do a reveal, thank you. Uh, so we have some questions here that have been given to us from the audience. Um, Quentin Crisp used to do this bit in his shows. He would uh, put cards on the audience's seats with little golf pencils and have them write questions. So we're very happy to bring back this, revive this Quentin Crisp tradition here today. So uh, I'm gonna read some uh, questions, Sasha. Uh, I might need to pull out my glasses. Oh my, oh my. Let's see, hold on one second. It's time for the conceal, not the reveal. <laughs> oh. Drag is a revolution and utopia, but it's also MTV and a presenter who profits from Fracking, oh thank you, yes, yes. <laughs> 60,000 acres, we don't know the details is that right? That. Uh, the how do you resolve that tension? Uh-huh. How do you resolve <laughs> That's that tension? That's my job? That's your job, <laughs> that's your job now. I'm not fracking. <laughs> no, um, I think we want to see that queer people can capitalize off of our own identities. <laughs> if other people are going to, we might as well do it for ourselves. Um, everyone deserves the privilege of selling out. <sighs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But seriously, I mean, drag has always existed both as a part of mainstream culture, something that can be borrowed and maybe a little appropriated, maybe removed from a radical context, and then at the same time has this rich connection to our community and to activism. And maybe 
that tenuous bridge that exists is something that's, that's positive. So I think the more, you know, people follow the journey from, from maybe the most superficial forms of drag to this amazing tradition that we're simply carrying on and trying to honor. I think that's a good thing. Let's spread the word through reveals and rose petals. <laughs> if it gets people's attention, it'll work. Hi, you're a goddess. <laughs> what do you tell your inner saboteur? Oh, God. <laughs> <clears throat> I just read them. Um, I don't. I, I think the, an inner saboteur is, whatever that is, pseudo-psychology, is very helpful. Uh, I like to bring my chaotic, self-critical voice to everything I do. I don't think that's really recommended, um, and it creates some strife. But I think the common, like a fully positive self-help book was not something I wanted to write and not the kind of drag queen I wanna be. I wanna be real and that, that can get a little messy and lacking in that sense of self-love that maybe people are used to. But I think it all works out and balances out. How do you maintain and stay confident in your authenticity as a person, an artist, especially with so many people seeking to silence, restrict? Mm -hmm. <sighs> I think maybe you get to a place where, I mean, what, once you've shared your most vulnerable and outrageous self, you have nothing left to lose. <laughs> um, so I just have continued to go for it. I try my best. Yeah, and then I think the context of drag helps so much. There's so much encouragement for people to truly be themselves. And honestly, if you, if you are a drag artist that, like others, lacking authenticity, you don't stand out. And I, I wish more of the world was like that, encouraging a place where you have to be truly yourself. So we're currently playing a Quentin Crisp uh, game. We're now gonna turn this into a Johnny Carson game. Some of you may recall that Johnny Carson used to take a question in an envelope and hold it up to his forehead and give an answer and then read the question. Sasha, I am currently holding this card up to my head Give me an answer, and then I will read the question. <laughs> We're going to test our psychic connection. Yes. Okay. I'm concentrating and sending it to you now. <laughs> okay. I have an answer. Let us hear your answer. <clears throat> <laughs> <clears throat> Tell those motherfuckers to shut up. <clears throat> what is your favorite weird fact about drag history? <laughs> is there a particular story you like telling about drag history the most? I mean, you can now answer the question as well oh, if I've you'd like answered. to, yes. Because I was going to ask you, actually, we talked about in the, uh, the green room, uh, we talked about who, if we could go back in time, yeah. uh, would we like to see as a drag act or who would we like to talk with as a drag performer? So you want to try to answer all that <laughs> yes. I You said you would, you'd want to... I think Barbette's I'd like to see act. Barbette's act, just because I'm interested in the technical. Barbette was uh, a drag artist who performed a trapeze and tight wire act. I would just like to see the technical proficiency in that. Yeah. Um, but then I would like to speak with Julian Eltinge, yeah. because I'm just kind of interested in a lot of Julian Eltinge's positions. Uh, Julian Eltinge was one of the top paid vaudeville female impersonators. But who would you like to have uh, seen or their act or to have actually met and talked to? Or would you, is there somebody you'd like to bring to the present and have them perform at one of the nightgowns? Yeah, exactly. I'll have them all at nightgowns. Um, 
I agree. I think it would be really interesting to see Barbette's act. There really isn't video of it. Like, um, and it delighted so many people. Like Jean Cocteau wrote about how it transcended gender in the air and even, yeah. Um, although it might seem dated by today's standards because she did rip her wig off at the end and then like flex her muscles. And <laughs> they interpret it as a performance of masculinity, which I like. But when we see it at, like in the end of Chicago, when... Mary Sunshine rips her wig off, it feels like really dated. <laughs> um, so who knows? But I, I really love Jose Saria, um, who I mentioned, who's on the scarf. And she performed parodies of operas like Carmen at the Black Cat Cafe in San Francisco before it was shut down by the police, um, th where the characters played drag artists and sex workers. And like, I would love to know what those songs sounded like. And I think that would be feel, still feel very relevant today. Absolutely. Um, speaking of uh, wigs, you're known for not wearing a wig. Can you tell us where that initially kind of started? <laughs> that yeah, I have two answers. One is that wigs are expensive, and I didn't think <laughs> I didn't think the cheap wigs looked very good on me. So, and I I have a nice shaped head, supposedly. Um, it's a good surface for gluing very painful things too. <laughs> and then of, I was definitely inspired by my mom. I think so many drag artists look to women in our lives who had an impact and, and sketched out what, what, um, what feminine beauty and power could look like. And since we recognize that femininity within ourselves, of course we connect with our own family. Um, and I had a, a really close relationship with my mom and when she was losing her hair because of chemotherapy, she shared that she felt insecure about not looking beautiful without hair. Um, but I thought she looked incredibly beautiful without hair. And the, the confidence she had in not wearing a wig, not trying to disguise her baldness, was particularly stunning. Felt empowering and feminist. And I just wanted to be that kind of drag queen and show all, women like her um, because she ultimately didn't get to see this much of my bald drag, um, but to show all the many women in that position that you can still look very glamorous, or at least there's enough people who think that you look stunning with a bald head. <laughs> Can you talk about straight etiquette at LGBTQ plus spaces? <laughs> straight etiquette. Straight uh, etiquette at LGBTQ plus places. I think this is maybe talking about bachelorette right. parties at drag shows. <laughs> it's like no oh. special rules for straight people. We don't believe in having different rules based on your gender or sexual orientation. That's the straight people's idea. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I just assume everyone at the drag show is gay and Frankly, I think they should probably try. <laughs> um, but yes, at nightgowns, I tell people to, this was the answer, to, to shut up. <laughs> but, you know, in a, in a respectful way, I, from the very beginning of my time hosting a drag show, I told the audience to be quiet and pay attention to what was happening on the stage and not try to touch the performers. And in exchange, mostly the performers do not, like, touch and grab the audience. Uh, although, you know, that's part of a little drag tradition as well. But we do it consensually at our shows. Uh, so yeah, sit down, pay attention, and be quiet. And tip your queen. Oh, tip the queens, tip the queens. Yes, we love it. I try to pay the drag performers enough that they're not reliant on tips. Just um, and instead we raise, we use the tips to raise money for housing and food charities at Nightgowns. And we've raised over 10,000, over almost $15,000 this year. If you could be an animal, what would it be? <laughs> Uh -huh. um, not saying you're not an animal right now, uh, but yes. <laughs> I do. I am fascinated by the aesthetics of birds, but I'm really terrified of them. So I think maybe I, I should try experiencing what a bird is like. 
I did a photo shoot as a pigeon for Halloween one year. And to get into character, I just, you know, to my mind, their, their mind is just like one, two, 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 one, one. Like they're very simple creatures. So it was an easy <laughs> thing to embody. But I've always, I, truthfully, I'm really obsessed with wolves and I've always loved wolves. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with Good. that. I think they're very, uh, so they're very final, sexy. Final two questions this evening, everybody. Uh, as an immigrant and drag lover, I am wondering, how does your Russian and international background influence your drag? Hmm. Okay, I have learned some things recently, and even though my, my family was born, were my grandmother and probably my great-grandfather on the other side were born within the Russian Empire, it is not what is considered to be Russia today. And um, my, my grandmother's family, for example, were Ukrainian Jews who were, my grandmother was actually born in China, in Harbin, um, escaping pogroms from Ukraine. And then she escaped World War II as well, um, the Japanese invasions and came to San Francisco. So when I reference parts of Russian culture, it's a little tongue in cheek because most of that wasn't anything that my family had. In fact, that was how probably the people trying to get Jews out of that area would have dressed. Um, but I think, I think there's, I mean, I guess in our heritage, even the, the places that our families have lived, there's so many interesting things to draw on and culture that goes beyond the wars and the hate and the restrictions. And to celebrate culture without becoming nationalistic about it, I think is something that happens really beautifully in drag. Because um, we add a little wink to everything and a sense of openness. So I have enjoyed playing with traditional folk fashions from Ukraine, from Russia. Um, but you did spend some time in Russia because you had a Fulbright there. Yeah. 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 To study Russian graphic designs? I was studying political art that was available for free in Russia. Um, and it was interesting. I guess there was a divide between... This is one of the things that got me really interested in drag is seeing how much the art world can be kept in elite spaces for the very wealthy museums and galleries that even if they don't have an expensive entry fee. There are like kind of different obstacles that prevent them from being ac accessible to people of all backgrounds. And I wanted to find forms of art that spoke to everyone and were made sense to people and were fun and yet also contained political messages. Um, the queer people that I interviewed in Russia um, didn't see that what they were making was art, even though they were creating paintings and writing poetry um, because to them art was something trapped in institutional barriers and completely disconnected from real life and real politics. And drag to me finds a way to blend those together. It says we are making art but we also are available to all. We're free from institutional boundaries and um, we're having fun and we're political. So I won't reveal it here, but uh, one of your immigrant relatives does have a connection to the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire Factory. Let's not reveal that. You'll have to buy the book to uh, <laughs> hear that story. Um, so the last question tonight, as someone with such an expansive knowledge of the history of drag, how do you see the future of drag unfolding? Unfortunately, there will be more pushback, but also more pushes forward. I am really hopeful that we, there have already been huge cultural shifts that most people, that many people in the world are accepting of queer and trans expression, of drag as an art, and I think that's just going to mean that more people are able to take part in this going forward. We just have to push through a little authoritarian repression, and we got this. We've done it before.
Drag is for everybody. Drag is for everybody, and I hope that this book will be just one in a chorus of many that illuminate the amazing history and context that is already there so that the drag of the future can be more grounded in the past, more honoring of the traditions and the leaders that have got us to this place, and more political and radical. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sasha Valor, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is, it's a really, a huge honor. I feel like an actual author, <laughs> which, you know, being here in this amazing space. And I'm really grateful that you all showed up. And thank you for making noise for drag and for this book project. Thank you to Joey Jeffries. Uh, you've made me feel like a real drag historian as well. So I would be very happy to sign anyone's book. I'll be waiting over to the side. I'm gonna keep my outfit on. I apologize if I can't hear what you're saying. It is very hard to hear through these pieces of metal. Just a beautiful, soft jangling in my ears, but I'll be smiling. <laughs>